Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. I am back today with another True Crime Tuesday video because that is my new series on this channel. If you're into that kind of content, definitely make sure to subscribe because I've got a lot of really cool things coming up and video ideas planned for cases. So definitely subscribe and also hit the notification bell because then you will know as soon as I post my new videos. So the case that I'm gonna be talking about today is the wood chipper murder of Hella Crafts. Now, I've looked at different ways to pronounce her name. I really do not want to get this wrong. And as far as I can tell, the right way to say it is Hella. It is spelled H-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. I wasn't sure whether you say it more like Heli or Hella, but I think it is Hella, so I'm gonna pronounce it like that. But if I'm getting that wrong, I just can only apologize because I do not want to get her name wrong. But as far as I can tell, I'm saying it right. I just really, really hope that I am. Helen Nielsen was born on the 4th of July, 1947 in Charlottenland, Denmark. And she worked as an air stewardess for Pan American World Airways. And it was while she was working this job that she met a guy called Richard Kraft. Richard was born on the 20th of December, 1937. And he was actually a pilot for Eastern Airlines. The two of them got to know each other working these jobs and they ended up getting together and they later got married in 1979. Once they got married, they decided to settle down and start a family in Newtown, Connecticut. And they went on to have two sons, Andrew and Thomas, and also a daughter named Christina. Hella kept her job all throughout this and when she finished having her children, she would continue to fly all around the world as an air stewardess and Richard continued his job and he also picked up a second job as a police officer. It appeared on the outside in that they were happy together. They had a nice house, children, good jobs, but things were really rocky even from the beginning with Richard cheating on Hella all throughout their relationship. It was reported that Richard was once asked why he chose to marry Hella and his response was, Hella was pregnant at the time we were married. We knew she was pregnant. It was too far advanced for a doctor to perform an abortion, so we decided to get married. Hella knew that Richard was having multiple affairs throughout their relationship. I think she was suspicious of it for pretty much the entire time. She'd seen things on his phone and she just knew that there was something going on. And at one point she met up with a divorce attorney and she also hired a private investigator and he was named Keith Mayo. Keith actually managed to provide Hella with photographic evidence of Richard having an affair and he photographed him outside of his family home and he was kissing a fellow air stewardess. So obviously somebody that he'd met on his job, just like how he'd met Hella. The following month in October, after Hella had received this photographic evidence from Keith, she went back to the divorce attorney and officially filed for divorce. While she was having these meetings about the divorce, she made sure to tell her lawyer, if anything happens to me, don't think it was an accident. She made sure that she told him that, which was very interesting. She was very worried about what Richard's response would be when she told him about the divorce and when he found out about it. She was very scared about how he would react. And she also made it known to her lawyer that Richard kept a lot of guns at the house. She wanted to make sure that he was aware of that too. Now, Hella had evidence of Richard's cheating. She could have easily divorced him on the grounds of adultery or something like that, but she chose a no fault divorce, which basically just means that they sort of separated more mutually. There wasn't one person who had done something wrong. And she did that because she didn't want her children to ultimately find out what was going on. And she was worried about what the community would think as well. Newtown wasn't a massive town, so everybody kind of knew everybody and she just didn't want it to turn into a big scandal. On the 18th of November, 1986, Hella had just landed in New York after working on a flight from Frankfurt, Germany. And she was in the car with two of her colleagues, all sort of carpooling back to their houses after working on the flight together. And as they pull up to Hella's house in Newtown, before she gets out of the car, she sighs and says, Richard's home. And that was the last time anybody would see her alive. So a couple of days go by after working this flight and nobody sees or hears from Hella at all. And whenever anybody tries to ring her, all they can do is get through to Richard. And he tells people that she's working on a different flight. 
but obviously the majority of her friends are fellow air stewardesses and air stewards and they all know the rules and the regulations at the airline means that you can't work another flight within a certain time period without having the specific rest period from working a long flight. That's just the way it is. And so they knew that she wasn't gonna be working another flight. That isn't how it worked. So they were definitely a little suspicious of this. But then Richard's story changed again and she had apparently gone to Denmark to stay with her mother who wasn't very well. But that was proven to be a lie when her mother actually spoke to people and said, Hella's not with me and I'm not ill, so what's going on? Obviously by this point, all of her friends and family are very confused and they don't really know what's going on. So Richard then says that she's actually on holiday somewhere with another friend and that is why people can't get in touch with her. But after another two weeks have gone by and nobody's seen her, nobody's heard from her, people are concerned and one of her co-workers, Rita Buonanno, I know that I'm gonna be saying that wrong and I'm so sorry, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Rita reports her friend missing with the police. And up to this point, Hella hasn't been declared missing. So everybody's just a little bit confused because nobody has seen her, but Richard keeps making up these excuses as to where she is. So obviously he's not worried about her being missing because he hasn't reported her missing, but no one can get in touch with her. So it was all just very strange. Keith, the private investigator, was also very worried about Hella at this point. He'd learnt that she was missing, that no one had seen her, and he had grown close with her. They built up a friendship while he was working with her, trying to figure out what was going on with Richard, and he knew their situation, obviously. So he was just worried, and he actually went to the police himself and said, I think there's something going on here. I feel like you need to look into this and take it a little bit more seriously. But for whatever reason, the police were just a little bit dismissive of it and didn't seem to be that interested. But Hella's friends also went to Keith and said, we are worried about Hella as well. And maybe you could look into it to see if you can figure anything out. And then you can maybe take that to the police just to get there, get the ball rolling a little bit because nothing seems to be happening. So Keith took it upon himself to start looking into this and to figure out what was going on. And he spoke to the Crafts family nanny who was a live-in nanny, so she stayed at the house. And she told Keith that she'd actually noticed a recent stain on the master bedroom on the carpet. And it was quite dark in color and she'd never noticed it before. So around this time, police actually went to Hella and Richard's house just to have a look around, obviously they'd heard from Keith and Rita's official missing persons report. So they had to start looking into it and doing something. Obviously that's their job. So they went around to the house just to have a look around and to chat with the nanny as well, just to see what was going on. Nothing official, just having a look. So they check out the property and they speak with the nanny and she also tells them about the carpet and the big dark coloured stain that had appeared in the carpet. And the police go and have a little look. So they go up to the master bedroom, but when they get up there, they notice that big chunks of carpet have just been cut out from random points in, in the room. So like, why would you do that? Like nobody just cuts like a square out of the middle of your carpet. That's beyond weird, but that's what Richard had done. There was big chunks of carpet missing. <laughs> While they were in that bedroom, they also noticed a smear of blood on the side of the bed. So not the mattress, but like the frame of the bed. During the search, as well as the blood smear and the strange carpet cutouts, they noticed a few strange purchases that Richard had made. So they found documents for the rental of a wood chipper and also a receipt for a brand new standalone freezer, which they couldn't find anywhere on the property. So at this point in time, Richard is just going about his day-to-day -day life, like nothing unusual has happened, that his wife hasn't not been seen for weeks. He's carrying on with his affairs that he's actively been having this whole time. And all of the people that he was actually seeing behind Hella's back knew that he was married, they knew that he had a wife, but Richard didn't mention anything to any of these women about the fact that Hella was missing or he didn't mention anything. Everything was just sort of 
normal to them. But obviously by this point, the police have had a look around the house and they've got the official missing persons report from Rita. And husbands generally are the first point of call when somebody goes missing. It just kind of happens. The spouse of whoever's gone missing tends to be the first person that they look at. That's just the way things go. So Richard was a little bit on the police radar at this point. While they were further investigating, they found out that as well as the £2,700 wood chipper that had been hired, Richard also hired out a U-Haul van as well. And he just told people that he needed it because he was gonna be getting rid of some wood and like debris around his property and chopping down a few trees that were on his property as well. So after the search of the house had been done and it was kind of getting round the town that there was something maybe going on, a highway worker named Joseph Hine actually went to the police with a very important tip. He told the police that he remembers seeing Richard parked alongside the Southbury shore of Lake Zor. I'm really sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I probably am. I really do apologise. But he remembers seeing Richard with a U-Haul van with a wood chipper attached to the back of it. And he remembers the date specifically because he actually was called out to work that night to plough because they just had a really bad snowstorm and it was the first snow of the season. So Joseph remembers that because that's quite a significant thing. He was called out, they were expecting the weather and it was the first bad storm. So he knows that that's when it was. So once they got this tip from Joseph, they went straight to the scene to have a look and investigate to see if there was any truth to what Joseph had said. And when they got there on the ground underneath some snow and some piles of leaves were wood chippings. And among the wood chippings were a human thumb, a fingertip with the nail still attached, over 2,000 strands of blonde hair, bone fragments, a big toe, lacy material from underwear, a mailing label with Hella Craft's name on it, and a tooth with jawbone still attached to it. These items were all obviously bagged up and taken in for testing and once they had been tested it was confirmed that the bone fragments were from a human and the tooth confirmed that it was actually from Hella. There was then an investigation in the Housatonic River which is the main river that Lake Zor is uh, like a reservoir from so they had a look in the main river and that's where they uncovered a chainsaw that had been dismantled, but wrapped up in the chain from the chainsaw was a lot of blonde hairs. When the chainsaw was looked into, they found out that it belonged to Richard. There were receipts for it found at the family home, and once they looked into that, they worked out that the serial number that was attached to the chainsaw was linked to the one that Richard had actually purchased and it was on the chainsaw itself but had been scratched off so you couldn't see it as much but you could make out that that was the same serial number that matched the one that Richard had purchased. Also the U-Haul van that Richard had rented actually had clumps of tissue-like material in it and when that was tested it was found to be positive for human blood. Based on what was found next to the lake, the Connecticut State Medical Examiner's Office issued a death certificate for Hella Crafts on the 13th of January 1987. Richard was the prime suspect for her death and he was actually arrested shortly after he arrived back in Connecticut from a trip with his children and he was held on $750,000 bail. Now obviously they didn't have a body but they had a lot of circumstantial evidence that pointed towards Richard they had everything that they found by the lake, they had the sighting by Joseph Hine, they had the fact that Hella had just filed for divorce and that she was clearly scared of him. It just seemed to add up and it really heavily pointed towards Richard. It was clear to everybody involved that they were never going to find a body, but the police managed to piece together what they thought that Hella Crafts final moments looked like. The authorities theorised that Richard bludgeoned Hella in their bedroom with a blunt object and then put her body in the freezer that he had newly purchased. It's sort of widely thought that the blunt object that he used to hit Hella was actually a police flashlight, like the big heavy duty police torch, but that hasn't been confirmed. That is just what 
I have read on multiple sources, but I'm not sure if that was the object that he used. So early the next morning, apparently the power had gone out in the area. So really early, he got his kids and he also got the nanny and got everybody in the car and drove to his sister's house. And he told the nanny that Hella was either already there or that she was gonna be meeting them shortly after they'd got there. And the nanny thought this was very strange, obviously when they got to the sister's house, Hella never arrived and she wasn't already there. So she knew that there was something a little bit strange going on. And Richard left them there and later on, a few hours later when the power had come back on, he went back to the house to finish what he'd started. He collected Hella's body from the freezer and put it in the U-Haul van. He then drove the U-Haul van with the wood chipper attached to the back of it to the shore of Lake Zor. He then used his brand new chainsaw to dismember Hella's body and then he put the pieces of her body through the wood chipper. Obviously her body was frozen at this time so there was no blood splatter, there was no body. It kind of seemed as though he had committed the perfect murder or so he thought. So this case was absolutely huge. As I said, Newtown, Connecticut isn't a massive place and everybody knew about it. So getting a jury together to do the trial was near on impossible. Everybody knew about it already. So they ended up having to move the trial and it was held in New London, Connecticut. Throughout the trial, they got a number of people in to testify, including the person who sold Richard the freezer and he said that Richard never gave him his name or his address and he insisted that he wanted to just pay in cash. They also got their nanny to testify as well and she told them obviously about the blood on the bedroom carpet that was then mysteriously cut out and disappeared. She also said that on the 14th of November she heard the two of them having a big argument and after that Hella was noticeably upset and this only happened a couple of days before she went missing. Richard took the stand in his own defence and he denied killing his wife, he has denied it through and through and he was also extremely cold and sort of reserved throughout the whole trial. He never showed any emotion throughout the whole thing, apart from one time when his sister was giving a speech and he did dab his eyes to sort of wipe away tears. But besides that, he showed absolutely nothing. He was just blank. Richard actually spoke to the judge at one point and he said, a great deal has been said about my apparent lack of emotion, but I have feelings just like everybody else. The judge actually responded to him saying, I accept that people are private people. People can have deep emotions and not express them. What I do note is the lack of any remorse. After a few days of deliberation, the trial was actually deemed a mistrial because one of the jurors felt that there was just not enough evidence to convict Richard of murder, so he just refused to continue. So a new trial was scheduled for November 1989, and this time Richard was found guilty of murder and he was sentenced to 50 years in jail. And this was actually the first murder conviction in Connecticut's history without a body. The Crafts children then went on to live with Richard's sister, and she thought that Richard did actually kill Hella. She was convinced that it was him that did murder her sister-in-law and so she took the children in because ugh, what else can you do? That is just such a horrible situation to be in but it's really good that they got to go to be with family. It's just such an awful, sad situation to know that your father killed your mother. That is just absolutely awful. In 1993, Richard actually tried to appeal his conviction and he stated that the circumstantial evidence wasn't enough to garner a conviction and that he had an unfair trial because everybody knew about his case so it just meant that the jury were already aware of it so he shouldn't have been convicted but the state supreme court upheld the conviction. Now at the time of Richard's conviction and sentencing obviously this was years ago and the law was very very different so it meant that you could get significant periods of time knocked off your sentence for good behaviour and for like doing work around the prison. This means that despite having 20 years remaining of his sentence, Richard Crafts was actually released to a halfway house earlier this year 
in early 2020. And he could now very well be free from that halfway house because he was due for complete release in June or July. And this video is going up on Tuesday the 28th of July. So chances are he is now out and completely free. I do think that Richard, who is now in his early 80s, should have served more of his sentence. He should have served the whole thing to me. The lengths he went to to cover up that crime and how much he had to have thought about it. He literally thought about every detail, even the fact that he froze her body because then there would just be no mess coming out of the wood chipper. I just think putting that much thought into it, it just goes without saying that you have to serve your entire sentence. You can't just walk free after doing that. It's ridiculous. And I also think that it says a lot that his children have been reported to have said that they would have felt a lot better if he was in prison for the rest of his life because they would just feel safer. And that's his own children, so that says a lot. And sadly, this isn't the only case that has happened in Newtown, Connecticut, which isn't even a particularly big town, but Newtown is actually where Sandy Hook Elementary School is. And obviously in 2012, they had the most horrific crime happen there, which I'm sure you all remember. I came across that when I was researching it, the fact that it happened in the same place. And I was just surprised to see that it was there in such a small town. I suppose it's probably bigger now because obviously Richard Crafts and Hella was a long time ago, 30 years. It's just really sad that that little town has had a lot of tragedy. Anyway, that is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed hearing about that case. I just found it absolutely mad and I just can't believe that now in this year he is now out of prison but that just blows my mind. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Do you think he should have got out 20 years early or do you think he should have still been held accountable for the awful crime that he committed to his own wife? Let me know what you think. I would really appreciate that. If anybody has any case suggestions, I would love to know. I have some lined up that I know that I'm gonna be doing and researching, but if anybody wants me to do anything specific, let me know, I'm open to suggestions. I would really like that. Whether they're unsolved or solved, I don't mind. I'm open to anything really. And also make sure to subscribe and give me a thumbs up on this video if you liked it. I put a lot of work into my research but I genuinely just I was gonna say I enjoy researching it obviously it's horrible to research and find these things out but I am just really interested in true crime and I just like to make sure that I'm getting all of the information so give me a thumbs up if you thought that I did an okay job this is only my second true crime case so let me know how I'm doing and I will see you in my next video bye